A 3,500 pound car traveling at 40 miles per hour into a massive block of steel and concrete. A $250,000 crash test dummy. Over 30 high-tech sensors and a team of dedicated professionals. This is just some of what it takes to keep you safe in your car. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety Test Facility crashes around 80 cars a year, meticulously, deliberately, and scientifically. It is precise and serious work, and it saves lives. Today we're seeing a new test. It is the Small Overlap Frontal Crash Test, specifically designed to protect drivers from the dangers of a common and deadly accident. What does it take to recreate such devastating car accidents? How is the information recorded and analyzed? And how does it make your car safer? We're going to show you on this episode of Popular Mechanics, how they do that. Ruckersville, Virginia, home of the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety's Crash Test Facility. Here in a 22,000 square foot test hall, cars are subjected to frightening, but all too real collisions. What they find ultimately makes for safer cars. The insurance institutes are nonprofit organizations involved in doing research on highway safety problems and the solutions to those problems. We are wholly funded by auto insurers. We have been leaders in doing highway safety research on all aspects of, of the problem, the vehicles, the roads, the people, and looking for solutions to the problems that occur out there. But here at the Vehicle Research Center, we focus on the vehicle. One of the biggest products of the Vehicle Research Center are our crash test ratings. We started in 1995 with frontal crash tests. We have done a study that shows that the likelihood that you're gonna die in a crash rated good by us is 35% lower than in a car we rated poor. The difference in death rates for our side impact ratings is a 70% lower probability that you will die in a side impact crash if you're riding in a good rated vehicle versus one that we've rated poor. As manufacturers change the vehicle designs, to achieve higher ratings in our tests, we are putting safer vehicles out on the road. So we're gonna be seeing a small overlap crash test and it's the latest in our evolution of crash test ratings. So the test we're running tomorrow is part of a series of comparative evaluations of what we call mid-size, moderately priced cars. And so we're testing all of those vehicles in the U.S. market to compare their performance in this new test and then share these results to the public uh, with the hope that that will spur their purchasing decisions so that they may choose a vehicle that has a somewhat safer design uh, and then that in turn will pressure the automakers to make better designs in their products. Crashing into a flat wall didn't represent the wide range of crashes that were occurring out in the real world. We find that there are a large number of these what we call small overlap crashes. It replicates the kind of impacts like you might have if you run off the road and then and hit the edge of your car into a tree, or when somebody crosses the center line and they clip each other on the, uh, on the driver's side by about 20 or 30 percent of the car's width. The small overlap crash test is a front crash that almost didn't happen, but unfortunately does and only involves a little bit of the structure at the front of the car. Today, the 2013 Nissan Altima is being put to the test. It has taken days to prepare the car, installing testing systems, taking exact measurements, and mounting the digital imagers. And in less than 16 seconds, it will all be over. The countdown begins. g foils are now warm. Charging is now complete. Test will commence in four seconds. Now let's analyze the crash second by second. The Ultima is chained to a sled 538 feet down the runway. The countdown ends and a specially built hydraulic motor engages and pulls the sled and the car with the force of 0.225 Gs. The car rapidly gains speed. At 10.7 seconds, high speed film cameras are activated to record the event. At 12.1 seconds and a distance of 355.83 feet, the vehicle hits the required constant speed of 40 miles per hour. It will maintain that speed until impact. At 15.2 seconds, the car slams into the small overlap barrier with a force of up to 40 Gs. 
the crash test dummy strikes the frontal airbag in 78 milliseconds. And 1.2 seconds after the impact, the car comes to a halt. Now it's time to examine the results. One of the most important factors that we have here is that these tests have to be consistent. They have to be repeatable. Uh, we have a series of checklists. We have a series of gauges and monitors throughout this whole area so that we can make sure each test is exactly the same. There has been crash testing as long as there have been motor cars. In the early days, engineers and researchers were looking at kind of the same things that we're looking at today. How well does the vehicle structure hold up when it crashes? What happens to the people inside those crashes? So many crazy different ways that people have used to make crash tests happen. It's like engineers gone wild. Moving the vehicles for a crash test has evolved from tying a rope to one vehicle and pulling it with another one, and then letting it go, to what we have here today. But of course, crash testing really didn't get a lot of attention until the 60s and 70s, when the predecessor to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration was established by Congress. When the vehicle arrives, it goes through a check-in procedure to check for defects. Vehicle preparation includes all of the test setup, uh, data acquisition systems, cameras, lighting systems, that sort of thing. Pre-crash measurements are taken and then compared with post-crash measurements. The vehicle is prepared with signage. The front driver's side tire is painted white in order to contrast the black tire with the black wheel well during video analysis. We want to maintain the vehicle at close to its normal weight, only adding what we put in as electronics. When we drain fluids, we want to remove gasoline. We don't want fires or explosions. In the place of gasoline, we use cleaning fluid. This makes it safe, and we can still tell if there's a fluid leak. We drain the batteries, uh, because once again, we don't want acid all over the place. So we add our own systems to the back of the car. Normally, those go in the trunk. And uh, they're 12-volt systems, and they supply power to the vehicle. The dummy needs power for all the accelerometers and things. The sensors in the car are measuring uh, vehicle accelerations as it hits the barrier. There will be 30 plus sensors in the dummy and four on the car. On the outside of the trunk here, we have our router, which is used for downloading the data after the test. All that data is post-processed on the computer and then we analyze it later after the test. We do a lot of measurements so that we know what the vehicle looks like before the crash and we can compare those measurements with what happens afterwards. And of course, we get the dummy ready for the crash test. At least the positioning part of things, there's very specific guidelines. Um, our protocol is followed uh, to the T to ensure that it's repeatable. The procedure we use, UmpTree, developed at the University of Michigan, is very, very repeatable. Procedure calls for you to collapse the dummy over, rock it side to side, pushing back on the knees, force pelvis and you know drive pelvis into the seat. That's you know, like somebody getting in the car and rocking back and forth and getting adjusted. Very specific guidelines on how to pick the leg up, lower it back down until it naturally falls, putting the heel down, then pointing the toe. Natural things, but followed in, in the exact order, they just end up in the same spot over and over and over again. And these dummies have to stay inside strict temperature and humidity guidelines to develop a, a baseline for uh, the way this tissue, how it reacts with everything, you know, it, it you know, gets too hot, it's too tacky, and uh, sticks to things, it's too cold, it's brittle and hard. Um, all, all these things are just to be a more of a natural or a realistic uh, feel the way your body would interact with uh, parts of the vehicle, plastics and, and fabrics and such. And very shortly, we get it back to the shed um, where it is also temperature controlled um, to sit overnight for 12 hours. days of crash testing, the crash test dummies were much less sophisticated than the dummies we have today. They had metal bones and rubber skin. You could basically watch where they moved when a car crashed and guess what that might mean with respect to injuries. 
Today's dummies are much more sophisticated. One of the big innovations in crash dummy development was the standardization of the crash test dummies. That sort of started with the hybrid two dummies. Now we're using the hybrid three family of dummies. And as dummies evolve, they are becoming better and better representations of the human structure. We have dummies um, for frontal impact testing, uh, side impact testing, and rear impact testing. And we also have child dummies for uh, child restraints as well. A dummy is made to be uh, repairable, an infinite lifespan because everything's interchangeable. The bones are made of steel, and then it's a, a dense foam covered in latex. The dummies in the crash test today are equipped with dozens of sensors, and each of those sensors is measuring force or stress or strain or displacement of the parts to which it's attached. Our crash test dummies today are equipped with a data recorder that is about the size of a cigarette pack and fits inside the dummy. All of the sensors throughout the body have little wires that go to this cigarette pack and collect all the data that we care about during the crash. Just the bare bones, no instrumentation, forty dollars to $50,000. Once you're fully instrumented, approaching a quarter of a million. Crash hall itself is 22,000 square feet. We have three runways that come into the crash hall. They're each 600 feet long. This allows us to crash from different directions. We can do vehicle to vehicle crashes. We can do bumper testing. Everything can happen within this area. The reason these runways are 600 feet is because of the machinery we use to bring the car up to speed. We need that distance to bring the car up to whatever the test speed is and then hold at that speed for a certain amount of time. The main feature in the crash hall, of course, is our barrier here. It weighs 326,000 pounds. It's made of concrete and steel. We can actually move this around in the facility within a certain area using a set of air casters. On front of this barrier here is our small offset barrier. We have these concrete blocks that you see around. These are 3,400 pounds apiece, and they're hooked together in the center. They're actually jointed, so they're all, they make like a chain. And if the car should spin off, we can contain it within this area. Uh, we have the lighting system up here, which uh, is strictly for the cameras. Uh, we'll be using almost all of these in the crash tomorrow. Uh, we have cameras, as you see, in the ceilings. We'll have more cameras set up on the floor. We'll have cameras on, on this side here. So we'll be seeing the vehicle from all angles. We will also have cameras inside the vehicle taping as this crash takes place. Vehicle safety, that is the vehicle's ability to protect you in a crash, has improved immensely over 50 years. One example would be our crash test of the 1959 Chevrolet Bel Air into a Chevrolet Malibu. What you see there is a vehicle that a lot of people would have assumed was safe because it was bigger and heavier, in fact falls apart when it runs up against its newer offspring. That's a result of there actually having been safety standards requiring vehicles since 1959 to be designed to protect people, which wasn't the case 50 years ago. We call this thing a skate. It rides in the floor and is attached to the cables that loop around in the basement. And this skate uh, is about 300 pounds and we'll be pulling the car along at about 40 miles an hour. The skate rides in a trough on the floor and it's got rollers um, to keep it moving smoothly. There's a, a hook on the front that we attach to uh, chains that was attached to the front of the vehicle. The hook slides over the, the chain and when the hook is moving, it pulls the chain, it pulls the car. But to keep the car perfectly stationary, we also attach it to the rear of the skate. We now have the car captive. We've got it with a hook in the front and then a ratchet strap in the rear so that the car can't move fore or aft relative to the skate. And then the skate is precisely controlled by our crash machine. Just before impact, we let go of the rear attachment and we stop the skate very abruptly. And when that stops, the car is able to just move forward without the skate having any influence on the crash. We do not want to pull it into the barrier and do any additional damage that wouldn't happen in a real life crash. <laughs>